Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Namo tasse bhagavato arahato Samma sambuddhase Homage to the Blessed One The Worthy One The Supremely Enlightened One Sadhu, Sadhu Sadhu Namo Buddhaya Fellow monks, meritorious lay disciples We're extremely fortunate to be living in a time when the instructions of a fully enlightened Buddha are available to us the instructions of a teacher who's realized these truths for himself. They're not just hearsay. They're not just his ideas. They're things that our great teacher, the Supreme Buddha, was able to see for himself. Because of this, our great teacher, the Supreme Buddha, is the, the supreme trainer of people to be tamed. Anyone that came to him that had even a chance of understanding the Dhamma, he could teach it to them in such a way that they would understand, that they would be able to, to practice in accordance with this teaching and to realize the results of this training. So today, we have the opportunity to listen to a very beautiful sutta from the Majjhimanakaya, the Subha Sutta, uh, number 99 in the Majjhimanakaya. So, Subha, was a Brahmin student. And he was visiting Savati one day. He was staying there for some business or other. And he asked the family that he was staying with, you know, I've heard that there are Arahants living here in Savati, that there are people who have realized the truth. It's good to see Arahants like that. Where could I go? to see an arahant. And they said, oh, you're very fortunate. The Supreme Buddha is living here in Savati right now. You should go and, and pay respect to the Supreme Buddha. So he thought that that was a good idea, and he decided to go out and see the Blessed One. So obviously he wasn't a disciple of the Buddha, because if he was, surely he would have known that where the Blessed One was living. He would have asked specifically, let me go see the, the Blessed One. So he went to see the Blessed One, he approached, he paid respects, and then he sat down to one side. And he asked the Supreme Buddha a question. He said, so the Brahmins, they say, that householders are following the correct path, that householders are following the true way, accomplishing the true way, the Dhamma that is wholesome. So what's a householder? Do you know any householders? Yeah, all of you are householders, right? Because you live in a house. Your family owns a house or you rent a house. And you do all the ordinary things that, that people in ordinary life have to do. You maybe you go to school, your parents have to have a job, have to go to work. So this is the life of a householder. So the Brahmins say that the householder is the one who's doing the right practice, who's living in the correct way, who's accomplishing the Dhamma. But that those who've gone forth into homelessness, so monks and nuns, they're not accomplishing the true way. They're not practicing the Dhamma. So what do you think about that? Does that sound right? That, that people living at home in a house crowded with children, that they're the ones that are living the true way. But people who've gone forth, who've shaved off their hair, put on robes, that those people are not practicing the correct way. So he says to the, to the Blessed One, what do you think about this? Okay. 
So you can see he's a student, he likes to, he likes to debate, he's challenging the Supreme Buddha, right? He's basically saying, you know, you're doing the wrong thing. You and all your monks and nuns, that's not the right thing to do. The highest practice is living at home. Now, was it just in the time of the Supreme Buddha that people said things like that? Do people say things like that right now? Yeah, they say the, the highest practice is living as a householder, right? You have so many challenges, so many challenges to overcome. When you are able to overcome these challenges, then that's the highest. That's the highest practice, right? Because it's much harder to practice the Dhamma at home. Therefore, it's a better practice, right? If you can practice the Dhamma at home, you're, you're even higher than, than monks and nuns. People say things like that, even today. So he asked the Supreme Buddha, what do you think about this? And the Blessed One says, I don't, I don't speak about this without making an analysis. Right? There's, not a simple, there's not a simple yes or no answer that that's right or wrong. The Blessed One says, I don't praise the wrong way of practice by either a householder or one gone forth. So if someone is living at home and they're practicing the wrong way, then I say this is a bad practice. If someone is living in a home and they're practicing in the correct way, then I say this is a correct practice. They're practicing the Dhamma. If someone has become a monk or a nun and they're practicing the wrong way, then I don't praise that, that kind of practice. But if someone has, has gone forth as a monk or a nun and they're practicing the correct way, then I praise that sort of practice. So the Blessed One knew that, that we can live at home and practice the Dhamma well, or we can live at home and practice the Dhamma badly. And he also knew that you can shave off your hair, you can put on robes, and you can really make a mess of it, right? If someone, if someone shaves off their head, they give away their possessions, they put on robes, they go and live in a kuti, but they spend their whole day sleeping, are they, are they accomplishing anything? No, no. But someone who goes forth and practices very diligently, right? They practice wakefulness. They're always trying to overcome unwholesome, unwholesome things in their mind. Practice meditation, learn, study the Dhamma, live in accordance with the Dhamma. Then someone who's gone forth is accomplishing something. In the same way, someone living at home, maybe they break all sorts of precepts. There are some people that that do that. They think that, that the only way to live at home is by, by breaking the precepts. The only way to make money is by lying, by cheating people. Some people believe that that's, that that's okay, that you have to do that if you're a householder. That's the only way to get by. So the Blessed One says, someone like that is not practicing the Dhamma. But is it possible to live at home and keep the precepts? Can people live a householder life? and follow the precepts, abstain from killing, abstain from stealing, abstain from lying, sexual misconduct. Can someone do that? Absolutely, absolutely. Can someone practice generosity living at home? Absolutely. Can someone uh, learn the Dhamma, study the Dhamma, practice meditation living at home? Absolutely. So when someone does this, then the Blessed One says, they're leading a householder life. That's, that's correct, that really is accomplishing something. So the Supreme Buddha doesn't, doesn't have a very, uh, a very simple answer, just saying, yes, householders are correct, monks and nuns are wrong, or uh, householders are incorrect, and the monks and nuns are correct. It's not simple like that. It's because of the actions that we do that makes a practice correct or incorrect. So then this subha, he has another challenge. He says, but the Brahmins say that since there's a lot of work involved in the household life, that that's more meritorious, that that's, that in that way, they're practicing the true way. But the life of, of someone gone forth, the life of a monk or nun, there's not a lot of activities. It's a very quiet life, and therefore, it's not so useful. So can you see that? Can you see how a householder's life is very busy? Are your lives very busy? Do you have school all day long and then 
maybe you have basketball afterwards and your parents have uh, many things to do. They have to take care of you, right? Running around doing all sorts of things. So this uh, Brahmin student says, because householders have all this work to do, because of that reason, they're the ones really practicing the true way. That what they do has a lot of, has a lot of benefit, has a lot of fruit. But the activity of monks and nuns, it's very little. They don't do a lot of activity, right? They're very quiet, just sitting, doing meditation, reading, going on alms round, very simple life. And because there are so few things that they're doing, it's of little fruit. There's little benefit to that life. So he asks, what does Master Gautama think about this? And the Blessed One says, I, I declare that there are some things, that there are some kinds of work that involves a great deal of activity, great functions, great engagements. And when it fails, it's a very little fruit. But there's some work that involves a lot of activity. And when it succeeds, it has a lot of results, a lot of fruit. So this is the first kind of activity that's very, very busy, a lot of work, and when it fails, they get very little. But when, they, when it succeeds, they get a lot. So this is the first kind of work, something that involves a lot of activity. He says there's another kind of work that involves very little activity, but when it fails, very little benefit, very little fruit. And when it succeeds, it's extremely beneficial a lot of fruit, uh, a lot of results. So he, he says, what's this first kind of activity that involves a lot of work that's very difficult to do? He says, agriculture, farming, involves a lot of activity. So have you ever tried to grow anything before? Have you ever had a garden? It takes a lot of work, doesn't it? You have to start very early in the year. You have to dig the soil. You have to plant the seeds at the right time. You have to water them. You have to pull up the weeds. You have to take care of them very carefully. So just think, even if you had a large garden, a farmer has a much bigger field to take care of. You can look out uh, here around the Asapu and see huge fields. Right? Imagine all the work that's involved in that. Farmers have to get up very early in the morning. They go to bed very late at night. There's a lot of work to be done when you're farming. Every piece of fruit, every vegetable that comes up has to have a lot of work put into it. And the Blessed One says, this kind of work, there's a lot of activity, and when it fails, very little results, very few results. So how does, how does farming fail? How can that fail? When there's no rain, right? when there's a drought, or when there's insects that come and eat everything, so a farmer can work very, very hard, planting lots of seeds, digging in the soil, huge fields. But then if rain never comes, what does that farmer get? Nothing, right? All the plants die. So even though he worked very, very hard, got, got very few results, got very little harvest. And the Blessed One says, this very same kind of work this agriculture, this farming, whenever it succeeds, it has a lot of results. It bears a lot of fruit. So someone can plant many, many fields, work very hard, and if the rain comes at the right time, if the insects don't come and eat, if everything works out properly, then they get big results, a huge harvest. So this is the kind of work that involves a lot of activity. And when it succeeds, gets a lot of results. So then do you remember the second, kind of the second kind of work that has just a little bit of activity? So the Blessed One says that trade is this kind of work. So do you know what trade is? Like business people? So when the farmer grows his, his crop, he has to sell it, right? And usually the farmer doesn't sell it to individual people because that's a lot of extra work. And the farmer has to be planting and, and weeding and things like that. 
So he sells it to a businessman, to someone who's engaged in trade. So when your work is uh, trade, then you don't have to go out in the field and dig the soil. You don't have to sweat at all. You just have to know the right people. Right? You buy low and you sell high. You get a good price for a large quantity of things, and then you find someone else who needs that, and you sell it to them at more money, at a, at a higher cost. So uh, nowadays, a trader can just sit in an office. They don't need to get their hands dirty at all. They just sit in an office and they make some phone calls, make some deals, some negotiations, and that's how they earn their living. And the Blessed One says, this kind of work involves very little activity. But when it fails, it's not of any, any fruit. So maybe someone is engaged in trade, but they're not very good at it. They don't know how to make good deals. And deals fall through. They can't get a buyer for what it is that they want to sell. And in this way, they don't make very much money. So he said, this is the kind of work that doesn't involve a lot of activity. And when it fails, it's not very beneficial. They don't make, they don't make a lot of money. But when it succeeds, they can make a lot of money. Don't we see many business people? They're very wealthy. Right? You don't see many farmers who are extremely wealthy driving around in fancy cars. Right? Usually farmers drive around in trucks because they have a lot of work to do. But business people, they can become very wealthy even though they don't have to work very hard. They can do most of their work from an office. So the Blessed One says, in, this, in the very same way, this household life, it's like agriculture. It's like farming. It involves a lot of work, a lot of labor. And if it's done incorrectly, if it fails, very little results, very little fruit. But if it succeeds, then it's very beneficial. So we can think, you know, when someone leaves the household life and they do a very bad job of it, right? Maybe they do some good things, but they also do some very bad things. They lie, they steal. Uh, the results of, of living that household life, are they good or bad? Do they go to a good destination or a bad destination? Bad destination, right? So someone who leads the household life, even though they, have, they do a lot of activities, if they do it incorrectly, if they do a bad job of it, then they get very few good results. But just like farmers, if things work out, if they, if they have a good harvest, if the rain comes, there's a, a big harvest, a lot of results. In the same way, for householders, if they do their work properly, if they follow the teachings of the Supreme Buddha, then they get excellent results. They could be born in, in heavenly destinations. They can even attain stages of enlightenment putting an end to this round of samsara. He says, just like uh, traders, business people, have very little activity, do very small amounts of activity, if they do it correctly, they get good results. In the same way, for monks and nuns, people who've gone forth, that even though they're not doing huge amounts of activity, even though they lead very quiet, simple lives, when they do it correctly, they get good results. When they do it incorrectly, they get bad results. The Blessed One said, uh, if, if you're going to, to lead this monk life or nun life, you need to do it correctly. He says, just like someone who takes a hold of grass that's very sharp, so some grass has sharp edges along the sides, that if you, if you take hold of that grass with your hand, it will cut, it'll cut your hand. The Blessed One said, in the same way, if someone takes a hold of this, this holy life incorrectly, you can really do a lot of damage. If you, eat the, if you eat the alms food of the country with a greedy mind, wanting more and more, bad destination. Right? You can be re reborn in a lower destination. But if you take hold of this, uh, if, if you take hold of this holy life correctly, so if you, if you take... If you're very careful when you hold that sharp grass, you can do good things with it. You can cut things. Uh, you can cut things with, with the grass. In the same way, if you follow this monk life correctly, 
then you can do very good things with it. You can cut through this ignorance. You can put an end, a complete end to this round of samsara. So then the Brahmin student asked him another question. He says that the Brahmins indicate five things for the performance of merit, for accomplishing wholesome deeds. And the Blessed One asks him to, to explain what are these five things that the Brahmins encourage people to do uh, to perform merit. And then Subha, the Brahmin student, says, yes, I'd be happy to. He says, truth is the first thing that the Brahmins prescribe for performing merit, for accomplishing the wholesome. The second one is asceticism. Do you remember what asceticism is? Asceticism? So it means leading a very simple life, not leading a luxurious life. So, uh, for example, just eating alms food, not having a lot of possessions, not having a fancy bed, not having a fancy house, uh, just making do with, with what people give you. Uh, this, is, this is the kind of asceticism that the Blessed One encouraged his, uh, his monks and nuns to follow. The third one, celibacy. So abstaining from all sexual activity, just like uh, you're doing today on the Uposita. The fourth one is study. This is the fourth thing that the Brahmins say that you should do to collect merit. And the last one, generosity. So truth, asceticism, celibacy, study, and generosity. These are the things that the Brahmin student Subha says the Brahmins encourage people to do to collect merit. So do you think these are wholesome things or unwholesome things? Do they sound like good things? Yeah, they do. They are good things. These are, these are also all things that the Blessed One encourages us to do. But the Blessed One has a question for this Brahmin student. He says, so tell me, student, have any of the Brahmins that encourage people to do this, have any of them seen for themselves directly the results of these actions? Have they, have they been able to see how people are born in a good destination because they perform these actions, because they, uh, because they speak the truth, because they engage in asceticism, because they practice celibacy, because they study, because they practice generosity? Have any of these Brahmins actually seen the results for themselves in previous lives, in future lives? Have any of them seen it directly? And the student Subha says, no, actually not. They haven't seen it directly. And the Blessed One asks, well, have any of their teachers been able to see these results directly? Have any of their teachers' teachers seen the results of these actions directly? And the Brahma student says, mm, no, actually not. Right? So we're very fortunate that, that we have a teacher like the Supreme Buddha who has seen the results of these actions. He, can, he saw exactly what happens when people perform these wholesome actions. And he knew the, the right way to practice these actions, that we can practice generosity in many different ways, that we can study the Dhamma in many different ways. And he told us exactly how we need to do these things so we collect the most merit. But this Brahmin student admits that, that even the teacher of teachers haven't, in the Brahmin tradition, haven't seen the results directly for themselves. So then the Blessed One asks him, well, tell me, how about those, those ancient seers who composed these hymns, you know, long, long ago? Did they claim to see these results directly for themselves? Even the ones that, that wrote these uh, instructions down, did even those ancient teachers see for themselves the results of these actions? And the Brahmin student says, no, actually not. Even those ancient seers didn't see for themselves directly the results of these actions. 
So then the Blessed One says, so it sounds like the Brahmins encourage people to do this when they haven't seen the results themselves. Their teachers haven't seen the results themselves. Their teachers' teachers haven't seen the results for themselves. Even the ancient seers who wrote down these teachings didn't see the results for themselves. And the Blessed One says, suppose there was a line of blind people, people who couldn't see, and the first one in line couldn't see. There was someone behind him holding on to his clothing. He also couldn't see. And someone behind that person who also couldn't see. Whenever, wherever they go, none of them could see where they're going. There's no one who actually has vision to, to keep them safe, to keep them away from danger, that can actually tell them what's going on, tell them exactly where to go. The Blessed One says, it seems to me like these Brahmin teachers, these Brahmins, these Brahmin teachers, these ancient rishis, they're just like this, this line of blind men. The first one doesn't see, the middle one doesn't see, and the last one doesn't see. So we can think about this. When we can't see, when we don't have this direct knowledge for ourselves, we want to be very careful not to, not to grab onto someone else who doesn't see, right? or grab onto someone who doesn't see, who's holding on to someone who doesn't see. We need to, to have someone in charge who has seen the results of good and bad actions, who has understood these teachings directly. And this is why our teacher is the, the blessed one, because he has seen for himself. But the Brahmin student realizes that, that the blessed one is, is talking about his teachers when he, said, when he talks about this line of blind men. And he's not very happy. <laughs> he's, he feels very insulted and he gets very angry. And in fact, he, he yells at the Blessed One. You know, he curses the Blessed One. He says, I'm going to get the best of you. And he quotes uh, another Brahman, the Brahman Pokkarasati. And he says, uh, Reclus Gotama, this Brahman Pokkarasati, he says this, some recluses and Brahmins here claim superhuman states, distinctions in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. But what they say turns out to be ridiculous. It turns out to be mere words, empty and hollow. For how could a human being know or see or realize a, a superhuman state, a distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones? That is impossible. So he says, there's this Brahmin who makes this declaration that there are many people in the world who claim to have seen things directly, but what they say turns out to be wrong, turns out to be empty, hollow, worthless. In fact, he goes as far as to say, it's impossible for a human being to realize uh, truth for themselves, to see directly with their own knowledge. Uh, and attain uh, attain realizations, attain uh, superhuman realizations. He says it's impossible. So the Blessed One asks the student, so tell me, student, this Brahman Pokrasati, is he able to read the minds of all recluses and Brahmins in the world? Can he see directly into the minds of all these people making these claims? And the student says, well, actually, the Brahman Pokrasati, he can't even understand the mind of his own slave woman, right? Even the servant living in his own house, he can't, he can't read her mind, let alone to read the mind of all the Brahmins and recluses in the world. So. Again, the student has to admit he's making claims that he can't prove. Then the Blessed One gives a very beautiful simile. He says, student, suppose there was a man who was born blind, so someone who had never been able to see his entire life. He couldn't see, uh, he couldn't see dark objects, he couldn't see light objects. 
He couldn't see different colors. He couldn't see blue. He couldn't see yellow. He couldn't see red. He couldn't see high places. He couldn't see low places. He couldn't see the stars. He couldn't see the sun. He couldn't see the moon. And this person would make a, a statement, would make a declaration, would say, there's no such thing as light objects and dark objects. There's no such thing as the color red. I've never seen red. I don't believe you. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing as blue. There's no such thing as yellow. There's no high places, no low places. There are no stars. There's no sun. There's no moon. Because I've never seen them. And since I've never seen them, they don't exist. So the Blessed One asks, would this person be speaking correctly? So if someone said, I've never seen the sun, the sun doesn't exist. Would they be right or wrong? They'd be very wrong, wouldn't they? So this person who's never seen these things decides, since I've never seen them for myself, then surely they can't exist. And the Blessed One asks the student, is this person speaking correctly? And he says, no. Just because he's never seen them, that doesn't mean they don't exist. He's not, he's not the right one to judge because he doesn't have vision, because he can't see. And the Blessed One says, in the same way, this Brahman Pokrasati, it's like he's blind. He doesn't have any vision. It's not possible for him to make this declaration whether or not there are people who've realized the truth for themselves. And he asks the student, so when these Brahmins go around making statements, should they make statements that agree with worldly conventions or that go against worldly conventions? So should they, should they make statements that, that we can see very easily that they're not true? And he says, no, they shouldn't. They shouldn't go around making, making statements that can't be proven or that can be disproved. He says, when they make statements, should they make statements that are thoughtful or thoughtless? And the Brahmin says, the Brahmin student says, they should think about what they should say. They should think about what they're saying. The Blessed One asks, should they reflect on what they say before they say it? And the student says, yes, absolutely. They should, they should reflect on what it is they have to say. And the Blessed One asks, well, should they say things that are beneficial or unbeneficial? And the student says, they should say things that are beneficial, that are helpful to people. And then the Blessed One asks, so this statement of the Brahman, Pokrasati, who said that, that there's no such thing as recluses and Brahmins who've seen the truth for themselves, have achieved superhuman states. Was that statement done by thinking about it? Did he reflect first? If he was really in a position to make this statement? Was, was he thoughtful? Was this statement beneficial or unbeneficial? And the student says, he didn't think about it. Right? He wasn't thinking. He, he didn't consider the fact that just because he couldn't see doesn't mean that, that these people didn't exist. Then the Blessed One says, so student, there are these five hindrances. Do you remember what the five hindrances are? Have you heard about the five hindrances before? Yeah. So what are the five? The hindrance of sensual desire, the hindrance of ill will, the hindrance of sloth and torpor, the hindrance of restlessness and remorse, and the hindrance of doubt. The Brahman Pokarasati is obstructed, hindered, blocked, and enveloped by these five hindrances. So the Blessed One said that these hindrances, they're corruptions of the mind. They're, they're things that make our mind uh, not able to function. So when we try and meditate, we sit down to meditate. If we have thoughts of sensual desire, it's impossible to focus on what it is that we want to focus on. If we have thoughts of anger, we can't pay attention to our meditation. If we're sleepy, if we're restless, if we have doubts, 
about wholesome qualities, we can't do this meditation. In the same way, the Blessed One says these five hindrances, they can block someone from having any sort of wisdom. So it's not just concentrating on meditation that these hindrances obstruct, that they keep us from having any sort of wisdom. He says the Brahman Pokharasati is obstructed, hindered, blocked, and enveloped by these five hindrances. It would be impossible for him to be able to read the minds of other beings, for him to achieve some superhuman state because he has these five hindrances in his mind. Then the Blessed One says, there are these five cords of sensual pleasure. Do you remember the five cords of sensual pleasure? So beautiful objects, things that we see with, with our eyes, that, that we like, that we want to have more of, that, that stir up desire in our minds. So beautiful things to look at. This is the first kind of sensual pleasure. So things that we see with our eyes, sounds that we hear with our ears, beautiful sounds, the sweet sound of someone's voice that we like a lot, beautiful music, sounds that stir up desire in our mind. Excellent smells, excellent tastes, excellent things to touch. These are the five chords of sensual pleasure. And they, they increase desire in our minds. They don't increase aversion. They don't make our mind peaceful. They, they make our mind have a lot of desire. And the Blessed One says, this Brahman, Pokharasati, he's consumed with these sensual pleasures. He's a householder living at home, remember, with lots of activity, with lots of sensual pleasures. And the Blessed One says, it's not possible for him to see things correctly, so consumed by sensual pleasures. He says, the Brahman Pokrasati is tied to these five cords of sensual pleasures. He's infatuated with them and utterly committed to them. So his life is devoted to making sure that he has these cords of sensual pleasures. And he enjoys them without seeing the danger, without understanding the escape from them. So what's wrong with sensual pleasures? Why did the Blessed One say that they were dangerous? Do they, do they burn our skin? No, not necessarily, right? Do they make us sick? Sometimes, not always though. What's the problem with sensual pleasures? How long do they last? No, they don't last very long. They're impermanent. Even the most beautiful physical objects, eventually they break down. They get destroyed. They're tied up with suffering. So anything that we're attached to that changes, it's going to cause suffering when it goes away. They're bound up with change. So just because something's beautiful, just because something gives us a little bit of pleasure right now, it doesn't mean that it's going to last. It can't really satisfy our desire because either our desire will increase and we'll want something more beautiful uh, sweeter sounding, better tasting, or the taste will change, the sound will change. It will go away and it will make us sad because we lose that sensual pleasure. And what's the escape from sensual pleasure? Abandoning this desire, this lust that we have for sensual pleasures. That when we do that, then we become free from them. We can put an end to our suffering, put an end to this round of samsara. But this Brahman Pokharasati that made this statement about there not being anyone who's realized the truth for, th for themselves, this Brahman Pokharasati, he doesn't see the danger in sensual pleasures. And he doesn't, he certainly doesn't understand the escape from sensual pleasures. Then the Blessed One asks the student, so suppose there were two kinds of fire, that there was one kind of fire that was burning because of wood and grass. 
So an ordinary fire. That's one kind of fire. And suppose there was another kind of fire that was burning not dependent on fuel, not dependent on grass or wood, or even nowadays we would say on gasoline or natural gas, right? Which would be more beautiful? A fire that was burning uh, on, dependent on something like wood or grass, or a fire that could burn independent of any fuel? And the Brahmin student says, well, a fire that was burning that wasn't dependent on any kind of fuel, that would certainly be a more beautiful fire, a more pure fire. And the Blessed One says, certainly, it wouldn't be possible for there to be a fire burning without fuel, except through psychic powers, except, for, except through supernormal powers. He says that just like this fire that's burning independence on wood or independence on grass, that this fire is like the happiness, the rapture that comes from sensual pleasures. So the Blessed One knew that there is happiness that comes from sensual pleasures. He didn't say that beautiful things weren't nice to look at. He knew absolutely that, that beautiful things, that we enjoy looking at them, that there is some happiness from that. Delicious food, we like it. There is a, a small sort of happiness that comes from that. But the Blessed One says, this is an ordinary kind of happiness. It's like an ordinary fire that's burning independence on fuel. When that fuel gets burned up, then, then the fire goes out. So the, the light that comes from that fire is very limited. The Blessed One says that there is actually a kind of happiness that isn't dependent on sensual pleasures. This is the excellent news that the Blessed One has to teach us, that, that there is a way to get happiness that's not connected with sensual pleasures. He says that there is a happiness apart from sensual pleasures, apart from unwholesome states. He says that that kind of happiness, that rapture, comes in deep meditation. So what is the rapture apart from unwholesome states? What is the rapture that is apart from sensual pleasures? Here, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied thought and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure, born of seclusion. So in this kind of meditation, unwholesome thoughts in the mind have gone away. The hindrances have, have been eliminated, at least temporarily. There's no, no sensual pleasures, no unwholesome states. And because of this, a very special kind of happiness arises. So could the Brahman Pokrasati experience this kind of happiness if he was overcome with the five hindrances? No, no. He wouldn't be able to see this kind of happiness that is apart from sensual pleasures. Again, in the second jhana, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind without applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of concentration. The Blessed One says, this too is a rapture apart from sensual pleasures, apart from unwholesome states. So even uh, this rapture that's, uh, that's still part of this sensual sphere, the Blessed One says, uh, it's not connected with sensual pleasures, with the cords of sensuality. And someone who has the five hindrances could never experience even this kind of, even this kind of happiness. Then the Blessed One goes back to these five, uh, these five things that the student mentioned that the Brahmins prescribed for performing merit. Do you remember what they were? Speaking the truth, asceticism, celibacy, study, 
and generosity, right. So the Blessed One asks him, what is the most beneficial? What is the most fruitful for the performance of merit, for accomplishing the wholesome? And the Brahmin student says, generosity, they say, is the highest of these. So did the Blessed One say that the practice of generosity was the highest thing for performing merit? No. He said, it leads to merit, absolutely. Incredible amounts of merit. But what is, was it the highest? No, that's just where we get started with the Blessed One's teachings. Do you remember in the Velama Sutta, what he said was the highest, the way to collect the most merit? Even, even developing the thought of impermanence in the mind for a very brief time, a finger snap, right? You collect more merit than huge acts of generosity. But this student says that the Brahmins, they declare that generosity is the highest. So the Blessed One asks him, say, for example, that the Brahmins are, are offering Adana, that they're practicing generosity and they invite other Brahmins for the meal. And there are two Brahmins there. And one of them has the thought in his mind, oh, may I get the best food. I am the one that deserves the best food. I'm the one that deserves the best seat, the best water, the best clothing. Oh, I hope I get the best of everything. Right? But it turns out that the other Brahmin, he gets the best food, the best seat, the best water, the best cloth offering, cloth offerings. So then this first Brahmin who had this terrible wish, he gets very angry. The fact that he didn't get the, the best things for himself. So the Blessed One asks the student, so if this is the kind of, of offering that the Brahmins are making, what do you think about this? And the student says, well, the Brahmins, when they make a meal offering, they don't offer it with the thought, may someone have an angry mind, may someone get angry. The Brahmins make a gift out of compassion, because of compassion for beings. Then the Blessed One asks him, well, if this is the case, if they do it for out of compassion, then isn't this the sixth factor that the Brahmins have? This motivation of compassion? And the student says, yes. It does seem that this is, this is a sixth uh, action that Brahmins do for making merit. Then the Blessed One asks, so tell me, student, these five things that you say the Brahmins declare as a way for making merit, where do you see these things most often? Do you see these things most often among householders or amongst monks and nuns, people who have gone forth? So what do you think? Where do you see these things the most? Who practices the most asceticism? Who has the simplest life? Who spends the most time practicing celibacy, practicing study, generosity, speaking the truth? So the Brahmin student says, well, actually, it's those who've gone forth, right? Those leading the homeless life, they're the ones that we see constantly speaking the truth, engaging in asceticism, leading a simple life, observing celibacy, engaging in study, practicing generosity, that it's actually the, the monks and nuns who are doing this the most. With householders, we don't see that so much. They're very busy, they have a lot of activity, right? They don't have time to do these things. So now the student has admitted, you know, after all this, he's admitted that the very first statement he made couldn't possibly be true, that, that the household life was the highest, the highest way to live. Then the Blessed One says, those five things, student, that the Brahmins prescribe for the performance of merit, for accomplishing the wholesome. These things I call equipment of the mind, that is, for developing a mind that is without hostility and without ill will. So what does the Blessed One call these? Equipment for the mind. 
equipment for the mind, for developing a mind that is without hostility and without ill will. And this is how the Blessed One says someone uses these things to develop this kind of mind. He says, Here, student, a bhikkhu is a speaker of truth, thinking, I am a speaker of truth. He gains inspiration in the meaning, gains inspiration in the Dhamma, gains gladness connected with the Dhamma. It is that gladness connected with the wholesome that I call an equipment of the mind. So let's think about this. When someone speaks the truth, right? when someone preaches the Dhamma, when someone doesn't tell lies, they can be very happy recollecting. You know, I'm someone who speaks the truth. When their mind is happy this way, they can understand the Dhamma very well. Their mind becomes very peaceful. We can see how this, it's not only a way for making merit in the future, but it's a way that the mind becomes purified here and now, isn't it? Just think for yourself for a minute. You know, you've kept these precepts very well. Even if you just think about today, right? Have you, have you told any lies yet today? No. Okay, it's very rare in this round of samsara to have the opportunity to know about these precepts, to have the opportunity to know about wholesome qualities. Many beings spend their whole lives telling lies, lie after lie. And they can't have this same kind of happiness that people can have when they tell the truth. In the same way, someone is an ascetic. They leave a very, lead a very simple life. When they reflect on this, their mind can become very happy. They gain a happiness connected with the Dhamma. Someone who's celibate, someone who engages in study, someone who engages in generosity, they can think, you know, I'm someone who's following these wholesome practices. Because of that, they have a happiness that's connected with the Dhamma. Their mind becomes very peaceful. Because of this, they're able to understand the Dhamma. The Blessed One says, it is this gladness connected with the wholesome that I call an equipment of the mind. Thus, those five things that the Brahmins prescribe for the performance of merit for accomplishing the wholesome, I call equipment of the mind, that is, for developing a mind that is without hostility and without ill will. So when, when the Blessed One said this, the Brahmin student asked him, so I've heard, Venerable Sir, that you teach the way that leads to the company of Brahma. So you teach a way that we can be reborn in a place where Brahma exists in a heavenly destination. And the Blessed One says to him, well, suppose, student, there was someone who lived in Nalakara, who, who grew up in the village of Nalakara. And this person would leave the village one day, and someone would stop him on this road when he was leaving the village. And they would ask him, do you know how you get to Nalakara? How do I get to Nalakara? And this this young person would say, would give him the instructions, right? Because he grew up there, he had just come from there. The Blessed One asked the student, would this person be able to answer quickly or slowly to give the instructions, to give the directions how to get back to his hometown? And the Brahmin says, well, this person would answer very quickly. And the Blessed One says, actually, that person might hesitate that person might be a little bit slow to answer the question, how to get to Nalakara. But if someone were to ask me how to get to the realm of Brahma, I could answer them very quickly. I would never hesitate. I know exactly how to be reborn in the realm of Brahma. And so the student says, please tell me. In that, in that case, please tell me. And the Blessed One says, listen, and, and I'll give you those instructions. The Blessed One says, what student is the path to the company of Brahma? Here, a bhikkhu abides pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness. 
So a bhikkhu practices metta bhavana. His mind is filled with exclusively thoughts about loving kindness. He's removed all thoughts of hatred, all thoughts of ill will, all thoughts of jealousy from his mind. His mind is very pure only with thoughts of well-being for other creatures. He directs these thoughts to all beings in, in front of him, all beings to the left, all beings to the right, all beings behind him, above and below. That there isn't anywhere in the world that his mind has hatred. There's no being that he has thoughts of ill will towards. The Blessed One says, when the deliverance of mind by loving kindness is developed in this way, no limiting action remains there. None persists there. So he's not able to do anything bad. He won't do anything to hurt any beings in any direction. Then the Blessed One gives a very beautiful simile. He says, just as a vigorous trumpeter could make himself heard without difficulty in the four quarters. So if someone were to stand outside and blow a trumpet very loud, would people everywhere be able to hear, right? To the north, the south, the east, and the west? Could a, could a tree get in the way and block that sound? No, even a building, a large building? No, that sound is gonna travel, not being blocked by anything. In the same way, this monk develops loving kindness and nothing blocks this development, or nothing blocks this attitude of his loving kindness. He doesn't have any thoughts of resentment. He doesn't think back to, to bad things that people have done to him. He has thoughts of goodwill for all beings, whether they're close by or far away whether he's friends with them, whether they're enemies, he doesn't have any thoughts of ill will to any of them. The Blessed One says, this kind of meditation, this kind of practice is how one is reborn in the company of Brahma. Again, a bhikkhu develops thoughts of compassion, wishing for the welfare of all those beings in the world that are suffering in one direction, in the second direction, the third, the fourth, above, everywhere, not wanting anyone to suffer. All the beings in the world that are suffering. Do you think that there are beings in the world suffering right now? Could there even be someone here in the Asapua? Maybe they have some sort of pain in their body. They have some worry in their mind. They're upset about something. So when we do this meditation on compassion, we wish that, that all of their troubles go away very quickly. So not only here close by, but beings far away in all the different directions. This person doing this meditation wants them to all be free from suffering. So in the same way, a monk develops thoughts of goodwill, of uh, appreciative joy towards all beings in the world. So. Whenever beings have good things happening in their lives, this monk is happy about those things. He's not jealous because someone has a, has a nice house, a happy family. There's no jealousy in the mind, right? He's very, uh, very happy knowing that, that people have done much merit in the past. And because of that, they can achieve happiness now. So he develops thoughts of joy for all beings in the world. And finally, thoughts of equanimity towards all beings, wherever they live. The Blessed One says, this too is a path to the company of Brahma. So when this was said, the Brahman student Subha, Todeya's son, said to the Blessed One, magnificent Master Gautama, magnificent Master Gautama, Master Gotama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what had been overturned, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. I go to Master Gotama for refuge, and to the Dhamma, and to the Sangha of Bhikkhus. Let Master Gotama remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge, for life. 
Sad, sad, sad. Thank you.